Okay. Ask everyone to come back in uh, for the session. I'd like to invite our panelists to please come uh, to their place at the table here. We're moving now into the panel, uh, a panel on the topic of um, education in the technical workforce. Um, as they're taking their seats, I'd like to introduce each of the panelists to you. Then they'll, we'll ask them each to make some remarks. I'm going to try to keep each of you on time. Um, no more than 10 minutes, is that okay? That should still leave us with uh, a good, bi good bit of time for discussion. Um, okay, um, I'm missing. Bruce Alberts, where did he go? The elusive Dr. Bruce, Al Bruce Alberts. Would Dr. Bruce Alberts return to the fold? Hmm. Well, let's go ahead and start with Dr. Duncan Moore. Uh, Dr. Moore was the Associate Director for Technology in the White House Science of, uh, in OSTP. That's what happens when I have something to eat. Between 1997 and 2001, he is now a professor in the Department of Optical Engineering at the University of Rochester. Um, our second panelist is uh, Tom Khalil. He is the Special Assistant to the Chancellor for Science and Technology at the University of California at Berkeley. We're really glad to have you out on the West Coast, Tom. And previously, he was the Deputy Assistant to President Clinton for Technology and Economic Policy and the Deputy Director of the White House National Economic Council. Um, Dr. Joe Bordogna is the Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer of NSF. We all know him well, I think. And he previously served as the head of the NSF Directorate of Engineering. Prior to that, he was Dean of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. And finally, I think we've uh, retrieved Dr. Alberts. Dr. Bruce Alberts is the President of the National Academy of Sciences. He's Chair of the National Research Council. He is a world-renowned bi uh, biochemist and the author of a book that I have used many times and perhaps some of you in the audience have as well, The Molecular Biology of the Cell, which is the leading textbook in his field, which is in way of acknowledging that not only is he an extraordinary scientist, a great science policy leader, but he's also deeply interested in the education um, that our young people are getting. So we're going to start with, um, with Duncan Moore and Duncan. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you, Marcy. Um, let's see if I can get this working here. I'm a Mac person, so. And a good thing, too. Got <laughs> <laughs> all the Mac people step forward. All right. We actually made this work. Uh, I was going to start, actually, with a, a story about Neil. Oh, I don't know what. The, it looks fine here. Oh, we got some light problems. Go back one. Oh. There we go. Oh, now Neil's here. So now I can tell a story about him. I was really worried I was going to start this talk without Neil being here. Um, I came to appreciate Neil on a, a trip that we took to California one time when we did four cities in three days. And I came to find out that it's, it's a good thing he's not an experimentalist. Um, what we did is we went to Boeing, and Neil managed to fly a 747 into the ground uh, outside the Hong Kong airport. And so I figured, now nah, this guy better stick to the theory and don't do any experimental work. Um, I want to follow up on some of the work that Shirley talked about this morning, but I'm going to cut the information a little bit differently than the way she did. And what I've done here is I've listed by major the top of 15, 20 majors in the United States. Uh, just as a ballpark, there's about 1.2 million people who get baccalaureate degrees every year. And the most popular major is business. And you can see almost a quarter of the people get business degrees in this country. And as you go down it, you see education, which we alluded to earlier, or uh, Shirley did, uh, about 100,000. Um, the w one thing she didn't mention is when you survey these people who got the degrees a year after they uh, have left their undergraduate degrees, they are not in teaching. There's only about 60,000 of them that are actually teaching. Uh, so that's, as we start figuring out all the numbers, this is an important thing to do. Then you see further down, you see um, engineering, down at about the middle of 50, is there a laser pointer here? Uh, yeah, but it's in my room. <laughs> you know. Use that end as a point. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so we see engineering's way down here, about sixty thousand. 
And we, as was mentioned earlier, we have physical science here down to about 18,000. Now that only tells a little bit of the picture. Um, what's really interesting here is you break out the engineering numbers and you find out there's only about 12,000 electrical engineers graduate every year. If you go out and look at the number of physicists that are graduate every year now, it's about 3,500. We are graduating fewer people with a baccalaureate degree in physics than we did before Sputnik. So it gives you kind of a measure of what's happening. So it can't be particularly surprising to people in graduate education in the physics-based uh, engineering fields that there aren't many applicants because that's where we get most of our applicants in graduate level physical sciences. And so the numbers have been cut in half in the last 15 years. Now, one of the things I like to point out, because I didn't bring the view graph, one of my favorite majors here is Parks, Recreation, and Leisure. And see, we're graduating 20,000 people in Parks, Recreation, and Leisure. Now, if you're a university president like Marcy, and she's looking at how to allocate her resources, she wants to be in a growth industry. And it's clearly Park Recreation, and Leisure, not EE. And so, you know, you better think about how you deploy your resources. Now, um, the other thing I want to show is the PhD and graduate degree, uh, what I call a problem. We're graduating about 45,000 PhDs and education degrees every year. If you look right below there, we're graduating about 40,000 or 38,000 um, lawyers. So we're putting one lawyer out for every PhD. And so if you think we're going to have a less judicial, judicious uh, society going forward, you're kidding. Because they want to be employed too. Now you come down here and you start looking by discipline. And engineering is about 5,600 uh, engineers okay, with a PhD. So we're graduating about six lawyers for every PhD in engineering. So they're always going to beat us. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Now, the other thing I want to point out down here is this is not a typo. There are only 768 people re receiving PhDs in computer science today. Um, it's, it, that's an amazing number. When you look at the data for it, half of them are foreign students. Now, this is just some other interesting facts, and these are the ones that are most interesting here. Most of us know this, about 50% here, 50%. So if you say 50% of foreign students, you're pretty close within a few percent. But the one that is, a, uh, I think, is a real problem is that only 17% of PhDs in engineering go to women. Now, from an international standpoint, um, I think this is kind of an interesting issue. What I've done here is I've rank ordered uh, the, the countries by the number of baccalaureate degrees they give. So, and by far, the U.S. graduates more baccalaureate students than anybody else in the world. And then to normalize them, we put down the number of those to the number of 24-year-olds. So you, that gives you kind of a measure of how well educated the population of that country is uh, on some line. Okay, if you assume baccalaureate students are uh, some measure of education. And the reason I got interested in this is um, I got interested in it because of China. And I started looking at it, and I, I got involved in this in a, as a competitiveness issue. You know, where is the Chinese economy going to be going over the next uh, 15 to 20 years? And how well educated is the population? And what are the salaries likely to be? And so it, I said, oh, gee, this looks like no problem. But then what I did is I took the data and cut it by the number of engineering degrees and rank ordered them. And what you see, in, and this does not include physics and chemistry. This is just pure engineering degrees. And what you see, it's almost 200,000. It's more than three times the number of engineers we're graduating in this country. Now, to put this in some perspective, it's not surprising they want to launch a man into space, or they have already, but they want to do that sort of thing. In this country, the total number of engineers is about two million. So it won't take very long for them to accumulate as many engineers as we have, and they're going to be a lot younger. The demographics are going to be, I'll call them, much more favorable if we assume that your best years in engineering and science are the beginning years. So to look at that as an international competitiveness issue, this is a very big deal. So the question is, what are we going to do about this? And I think we've all, we all agree there's a problem in K-12 education. Um, it's, it's very mixed, though. You have some school districts that are very excellent in this country where the taxpayers are willing to pay lots of extra taxes to support the schools. We have a situation where 
in the elementary, well, we should remember, there are two types of teachers. There are science teachers and there are teachers of science. So your biology, chemistry, physics are teachers of science, but most kids have a science teacher who is teaching English, math, everything else until they're at least in the sixth grade. And when you look at the demographics, as somebody pointed out this morning, we're losing them in the fifth grade, the fourth, fifth grade. And why is that? Well, one of the things we've learned is that guidance counselors, which is hard to believe this is where my one interesting problem would be, are telling young people, these are high school students, you know, oh, you're going to go to college. Um, oh, so you're not good in science and math. You can be an elementary school teacher. Well, that's probably not the direction we want to be going. And so what we have is we have a very big disparity among the teachers, of the K-12 uh, teachers, particularly in K-6. And that's where we tend to, tend to lose them. Somebody else mentioned this morning the issue of community colleges. And the community college system has not gotten the respect that I think they deserve. In New York State, 45% of the people who become teachers, eventually get teaching degrees, started in the community college system. If we don't get to those students while they're still in the community college system to get them interested in science and math, it's not likely they're going to change when they go to uh, switch over to the four-year schools. They, it just isn't going to happen. And so there's a real issue that we've got to address in, among the community colleges and how we're going to do that. Now, I believe we have a huge marketing problem. I know those of us in this room don't want to hear it's a marketing problem, but I really believe it is. And I have a great example of that. Penn State, for several years, has run a science camp for fifth and sixth graders. At the beginning, it was called a camp for chem on chemistry. And there was one on physics. And what they found is fifth and sixth graders didn't want to do that. They didn't know what chemistry was. It was a fear factor. That's something you take in high school. You know, I'm only a fifth grader. And if you, know, you get some of the good teachers, some of the good students, you know, who, who parents are pushing them. But what they did is they changed the name of the camps. And it's no longer called chemistry. It's called potions. The physics one is no longer called physics. It's called Quidditch. And for those people who do not read uh, Harry Potter, those are part of that. So, they, you know, that was probably the most... Um, well-received book among that age group. Is the course content any different? No. Do they dress up a little bit? Yeah, the teachers dress up in various types of costumes and all that sort of thing, and they get them engaged in doing the same experiments. They have one based on CSI, you know, and, and so it's a forensics course. And so what you have to do is we have to figure out a better way of packaging what we're already doing. We, we need to get some more marketing experience in here, and we're not doing that. Um, the other thing that I think we need to think about, which is goes to what uh, Neil's have been a big advocate of, is speaking to the general public. We, you know, we speak, spend a lot of time talking amongst ourselves. But if you want to do something really scary, go t uh, give a talk to a Rotary Club in, a, in a, a rural environment. That is really interesting experience. And the point is, we, need to, we are not delivering our message to the people who are really voting. We're delivering it to ourselves. And that's not really any problem. And one of the things I think we have to do is we always have to have something in our pocket that we can pull out in the middle of this whole talk when you're talking at Rotary Club. And you say, do you know what this is? And they say, well, I don't know what it is. You say, oh, this is a pill camera. You swallow this, and it takes 50,000 photographs of inside your small intestines. And people say, oh, wow, that's science? And they, they start getting it. They say, oh, yeah, now I know why we should be supporting the science and engineering enterprise. Okay, I want to wrap this up um, quickly with another story about Neil. Uh, this, there's so many great stories about Neil. Um, and uh, Tom's going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, there, there were a group of us, in Tom, including Tom and um, uh, other people in this, in this room, who got together from time to time to talk about initiatives and how initiatives might be done, all that sort of thing. And we had an initiative that we were talking on that was, had the name Elder Tech, which was the one that was uh, how does science and technology help people live independently 10 years longer by the year 2010. That was kind of the bumper sticker part of that. Uh, uh, Jeff Smith wanted to call it Geezer Tech, but, but that was not politically viable. Um, so, you know, we, we had to be sensitized to that. Well, you know, while I was there, I was always pushing some new tech thing. And, uh, and there was crime tech and there was some of those. But Neil felt there was a big void. 
And so he really wanted us to work on pet tech. <laughs> and so I assume that he's gone underground on this whole thing, that he's doing it. But you know, we, there were some of the research topics that we came up with was um, better poop removal devices, uh, dog showers in every home, and dog uh, barking translation uh, systems. And so I think that there's a real business opportunity here. And I just want to say happy birthday to you, Neil. And I really enjoyed working for you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for sticking it out. I'm going to pull a Bill Wolf and, and talk about a totally unrelated topic, if that's all right with you. And, and uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about is uh, w the importance, at least as I see it, of uh, science and technology uh, initiatives as a, as a mechanism for uh, increasing support for, for research and development. And, uh, I had the good fortune uh, to work with uh, Dr. Lane during those dark days of peace and prosperity um, on, on a number of uh, initiatives, including the increase in support uh, for, for long-term IT research and development and the National Nanotechnology Initiative. And th those were both really fun and, and rewarding and I believe important for the nation to, to work on. Um, but the, the reason that I, I believe that these uh, initiatives are important as, as a mechanism for increasing support for research and development is that the argument that the uh, science community would traditionally make, which was give us 7% more money than you gave us last year, was not the most effective argument. Um, it, you know, OMB had a kind of a allergic reaction to the notion that there should be some arbitrary level of support. And by the time budget decisions reached the White House, people were trading off against, you know, real tangible initiatives. Uh, you know, we should have 100,000 cops in the street, or we should improve the security of our embassies, or we should reduce class size by 25% in the early grades. And since uh, all of the decision makers were non-scientists, to say that the uh, budget of agency X should increase by 7% was, was not anything that they resonated with. So that was run, one reason. I think the second reason was that many of these initiatives had the potential to be in areas uh, that Don Stokes has referred to as uh, pastures quadrant, that is fundamental research that is also motivated by considerations of use. And if you have to pick some areas where it's possible to capture the public imagination, this is definitely uh, strong candidate. Third is that by focusing on a problem or an area, you also have the potential to increase support for interdisciplinary research, which as uh, Jack Gibbons has mentioned is particularly important. Um, and the fourth thing is that these initiatives would also uh, often build support for increases in the core budget. During the last couple years of the administration, we were able to get 15% increases in the NSF budget. And I believe that we would not have been able to do that in the absence of all the excitement around uh, some new areas of research and in information technology and nanoscale science and engineering. Now, having said that, I do think that there are a number of risks with the initiative process that we need to be cognizant of. One is that not all areas of research are going to lend themselves equally well to initiatives. I can't see the President of the United States and the State of the Union announcing a new initiative in string theory, for example. Um, the second is that you do have a potential to have a kind of disease of the weak phenomena uh, where areas are chosen on the basis of political whims or, or fads as opposed to uh, serious priority setting. The third difficulty is that it's a lot easier to launch these than it is to sustain them over a long period of time. The fourth is, is that, as Dr. Marburger noted, there are 13 different appropriation subcommittees. So we can come up with this you know, well thought through crosscut, um, and that may not have any real impact on the decision making of the individual appropriation subcommittees who are making trade-offs between the veterans budget and the National Science Foundation budget or between important water projects in the district and the, uh, the, the budget of the Department of Office of Science. Um, and then finally, you have the divided government phenomena, and we often, we uh, would occasionally encounter the phenomena that uh, if you guys are for it, we must be against it, uh, irrespective of the merits. So I think that 
Um, in terms of, uh, you know, John Holdren introduced the notion of everyone uh, tithing their, their time and energy. Uh, and I think one of the things that civic scientists could do is to really help prepare some of the foundation uh, for developing the rationale for uh, s some new initiative areas. Um, and these uh, are some of the questions that we typically had to answer before we had any chance at all of, of building uh, White House and ultimately congressional support for a new science and technology initiative. Um, and these are just a couple of the questions, but I'll give you a flavor for it. First is, what's the rationale for government involvement? Why can't the private sector do it? Second, what's the uh, return on investment f uh, from past investments? Um, this is one of the things that really enabled us to make a strong case for the increased investment in long-term information technology research. We could point to the huge impact that uh, the uh, government investments in the ARPANET and the NSFNET had had, for example. The third is, uh, what are the potential outcomes or grand challenges that might be associated with an increase in funding? Um, and even though uh, scientists and engineers would wince occasionally when they heard the president talking about storing the Library of Congress in a device the size of a sugar cube, uh, or uh, making materials that were stronger than steel in a fraction of the weight, or detecting cancerous tumors when there are a few cells in size, I can guarantee you that if we'd said we need a new initiative to increase support for condensed matter physics and material science, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. So occasionally being uh, clearer than the truth is, is necessary uh, to build support for these initiatives. A fourth uh, is developing a detailed research agenda associated with the initiative. A fifth is to try to describe what might be achieved or accomplished at different levels of support and figuring out how much the federal government is already investing. The sixth is to think about the modalities of support. Uh, what's the appropriate mix between intramural and extramural? Uh, should this be done through PIs, small groups, uh, centers, shared facilities, that type of thing? Seventh is to look at policy instruments uh, beyond research and development that need to be considered in the context of energy, for example. We've been talking about information campaigns uh, and, and tax incentives as being important to achieve these national goals. Um, and the eighth, uh, another question, final question, is whether the government has the capacity uh, to manage uh, an increase in funding in this area, and is there a research community that is worth investing in? Uh, Henry and I tried to work on increasing support for long-term uh, uh, educational research, and, and one of the problems that we encountered was that Department of uh, Education did not have a stellar track record uh, in in managing uh, uh, research and development in, in education. It was, it was sort of like the, the Woody Allen story in, in which the two old ladies talking to each other, and one of them says, oh, the food here is terrible. And the other one says, yes, and the portions are small, too. And that's sort of how we felt about the current state of the nation's uh, education research. So uh, in the interest of being provocative, uh, let me toss out uh, 10 examples of areas that I think might be a, a number of which we've already discussed today. Uh, that might be suitable for initiatives. Many of these areas, there's already a lot of activity going on, but I think one could certainly make a strong case for expanded activity. Uh, the first is uh, to uh, create the scientific and technological foundations for affordable carbon-free energy sources that will scale to uh, terawatts, hopefully 10 to 30 terawatts of carbon-free energy by 2050. The second is to invest in learning science and technology such that we have a rigorous understanding of what interventions actually improve student performance. Uh, so this will require much more aggressive use of uh, randomized clinical trials and the development of new technologies that would allow us to approach the effectiveness of a one-on-one -on -one tutor, so moving towards a class size of one. The third is an investment in what Jeffrey Sachs has called weapons of mass salvation. Uh, that is harnessing some of our scientific and, and technological know-how to solve some of the, the many challenges of developing countries. Uh, currently, um, uh, as of at least a couple years ago, we were investing 
more in uh, male pattern baldness than we were in AIDS, TB, and, and malaria. And while Neil might agree with that allocation of resource, I think, I think one can make an uh, a, 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 a argument that, that we ought to be in, investing more in, uh, in infectious diseases relative to developing countries. The fourth would be to uh, invest in R&D that would create the foundations for a sustained increase in productivity of, say, 3%. Uh, the reason that economists believe that this is so important is that if you have a 1% productivity growth rate, uh, standards of living double every 70 years. If you have a 3% uh, productivity growth rate, they double every uh, 23 years. Uh, so I think what we've learned is that it's not only new information technologies, but it's new ways of, of organizing work um, and new ways of using that technology that lead to the increases in productivity. The fifth would be um, exploring some of the non-health applications of biology. Uh, currently, since NIH is our major supporter of biological research, we're not looking at, I think, seriously at some of the exciting potentials for non-health applications. Sixth would be uh, biodefense. How are we going to live in a world in which the capacity to create genetically engineered uh, pathogens that are going to be more virulent, resisting to existing vaccines and antibiotics, uh, and may have long latency periods before we see any symptoms? Um, how are we going to live in, in that world uh, w without uh, large uh, casualties? The seventh uh, would be uh, an initiative in, in e-science, um, what the uh, report from to the National Science Foundation called Cyber Infrastructure. How do we harness the uh, advances in computing networks, network scientific instruments, sensors, and tools for collaboration and analysis for, uh, to accelerate the pace of discovery in all disciplines of science and engineering? Uh, eighth would be uh, doing an experiment with some of the ideas that Paul Romer has suggested that focus on the supply side rather than the demand side uh, to expand the science and engineering workforce by, for example, significantly increasing the number of scholarships for uh, people who pursue graduate education in the natural sciences and engineering. Uh, ninth on my list would be uh, trying to figure out what's going to happen after Silicon CMOS, which is currently scheduled to run out of gas in uh, 2016. Uh, and 10th would be looking at the uh, issues of uh, grant size and duration, particularly in the uh, NSF budget, which has average grant sizes of 120,000. So if you're a faculty member with uh, 10 or 15 graduate students in your group, uh, that is not, really not a, a viable option in terms of being able to support a, a research group. So I, I think an effort to increase the NSF budget is really desperately needed. So, um, what, so in conclusion, <laughs> uh, the, t the two things that I believe the, the research community should think about doing is, one is, what role is there for organizations such as the National Academy and the AAAS and the scientific societies in uh, proposing and developing some of these new initiatives? And I think the second thing is that, uh, a group of leaders in the scientific community should approach some high net worth individuals about bankrolling uh, one or more well-financed, uh, well-organized campaigns to pass one or more of these. If you look at how the NIH doubling campaign happened, uh, one of the critical pieces was a philanthropist just decided to bankroll a very well-financed and well-organized political campaign involving PR, grassroots activities, coalition building, lobbying, and polling. And I think that is the type of activity that is ultimately required to take some of these uh, exciting ideas and, and move them into reality. Thank you very much. And Neil, thank you very much for the opportunity to work with you. Uh, Tom Cleo spoke of initiatives that garner budget attention. And uh, we used to think of them in terms of what he generally said, but he did say education at one point in there. Uh, research initiatives, uh, NSF, they're called priority areas, are listed in the budget. Uh, we have one that's called Workforce 21st Century, announced in the fiscal 2004 budget, which focuses on the domestic population and broadening participation as an initiative to garner budget attention and other things. 
Now this is uh, in honor of Neil Lane, this whole affair, these two days. And I like to put in the context of what I know about Neil, uh, what happens in the back room. Uh, Neil and I spent time together as director and deputy director. And uh, we may not have spoke of it in this way exactly back then, Neil, but a lot of the discussions uh, in the back room, it's when you get down to brass tacks, where you're gonna put the money, go something like, no, 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 that's not what it is, it's this. Or in many cases, this is what it is. And in other cases, this is what it isn't, it's this, it's that. And a lot of discussion goes on, and I wanna use that theme uh, today in my remarks. Uh, for example, uh, what is nano and what isn't nano? Okay, nano isn't just about making small things or using small things to make bigger things better. Nano's about lifting all disciplines. So if you think about what nano's gonna do to all the disciplines, that's the issue. So what is it, what isn't it? So happy birthday, Neil. And uh, I'm gonna go on and try to do something that might make you proud of me. Uh, and I wanna thank Shirley Malcolm for um, her astute remarks. She's right on the button and her dedication to meeting a challenge of supreme importance to the nation, and that is broadening participation in the science and engineering workforce. Uh, thinking of what to say on this issue, in terms of gap bridging, I decided to make some remarks uh, that derive from a lot of questions and discussions uh, we've been receiving this after in a sequence of recent NSF speeches on broadening participation. These questions and discussions tend to drift toward adjacent issues which, while important in themselves, take us off point and off focus, thus mitigating our efforts to broaden participation. We all recognize that greater diversity in the science and engineering community is vital to our nation's prosperity and security. You've heard it these last few days. We understand how including the full gamut of intellectual perspectives and talent gives us an edge in discovery and innovation. And we know that embracing diversity is the right thing to do, or in Guy Stever's words of his this morning, it's indeed something we should do. Now we can celebrate the clear progress we've made on many fronts in this area. Yes, there is more diversity in the science engineering workforce compared to 30 years ago. And maybe more importantly right now, there are some people who know how to make it so. Now you can think about, there are people who know how to get this stuff done, but well, there's no algorithm for it. They do it in different ways, in many ways it's gonna cat. We ought to invest in them accelerate the whole thing. So anyhow, even though we sort of made progress, the fact remains that years of dialogue and effort have not produced a surge in forward momentum that is necessary and increasingly urgent to reach our objectives. This is surely one of the significant gaps between science and society. That's the theme of this conference. If we are going to bridge this gap, we need to be absolutely clear about our common aims and then move decisively beyond agreement the collaborative action. How we get the job done is by no means straightforward. Our world, like the science and engineering of our times, is increasingly complex and dynamic. The challenge of diversity is no exception. Accelerating our efforts to meet this challenge will require, for starters, a refined and sophisticated posing of the questions we should be asking. Now, keeping our antenna tuned to the need for action, I'll offer some contrasting viewpoints that may help us clarify our strategy and vision. These contrasts suggest a subtle shift in focus, a reframing of issues that may provide a more useful context for effective action. In other words, I want to contrast what broadening participation in the science and engineering workforce is not about as a way of suggesting what it is about. First, it's not about the total number of engineers and scientists the nation may or may not need. More and more frequently, we seem to be stymied and distracted from our diversity goals by questions about trends and statistics. Do we really need more scientists and engineers? Is the demand for them really greater than the supply? Are PhDs going to go begging for career opportunities in academe and government and industry? Now, what it is about is a need to include a larger proportion of women, minorities, and persons with, of diversity in the scientific workforce. Whatever the total numbers turn out to be, we need a robust and varied mix, and that means expanding diversity. And I think Shirley alluded to that this morning, too. Second, it's not about the number of foreign-born students, scientists, or engineers who study or work in the United States. They've always been a source of strength for our society and economy and a way of lifting human potential globally. It is about fully developing our domestic talent 
In our knowledge-intensive society, we need to capitalize on all available intellectual talent, not only to advance, but also to keep our nation humming. Although we are doing better than we did 30 years ago, we've not yet seriously tapped our nation's competitive ace in the hole, women, underrepresented minorities, and persons with disabilities. Now we're playing catch up in a very competitive world. We need to understand that diversity is an asset and this similarity a valuable component of progress. An open door policy that educates and enables our own citizens to be contributing participants in our great democratic system, as well as continuing the successful policy of embracing those from abroad will make us a genuine welcoming nation to both talent from abroad and from the nation's women and other minorities from within. Third, it's not about keeping businesses from going abroad. Science and engineering have always been international. In today's increasingly networked world, we're unlikely to staunch the flow of mobile and global enterprises into and out of our borders, even if we wanted to. It is about educating scientists and engineers with a competitive edge. To be on the frontier of discovery in the vanguard of innovation requires new capabilities and skills that are qualitatively different from production line education that turns students into commodities bought on the global marketplace at the cheapest price. We want to create an environment that attracts an eclectic and diverse array of students to pursue studies in science and engineering and encourage them to stay the course. We need a variety of learning paths that support creative, world-class scientists and engineers. Fourth, I have five of them. <laughs> It's not about demanding that our students learn more and more basic knowledge or delve deeper into a specialty. This is a good thing to do, but knowledge is changing so rapidly that sticking to this path alone could be a recipe for disaster. Part of that disaster is having a job after we put you through. It is about providing students with additional capabilities that will enable them to work across boundaries, to handle ambiguity, to integrate, to innovate, to communicate, and to cooperate. These are components of a holistic education that not only suits the science and engineering of our times, but thrives on diversity. The differences in race, ethnicity, and gender that abound in our society are a positive force to engender this creativity and dynamism. The divisions we experience will hold, only hold us back and sap our energy until we erase them. Fifth, I'm not gonna say last because I just started thinking about these the last few months. There might be others. Fifth, achieving our common goals is not about working from the bottom up or from the top down. We are frequently asked, what is the National Science Foundation to do, to, doing to solve these problems? NSF is certainly a willing and able player, as it should be. We are very seriously committed to broadening participation. In fact, our statutory mandate explicitly includes this responsibility. This means taking action, not just talking. We identify and support innovative programs to broaden participation, but we're in no means capable of addressing all the issues single-handedly. Broadening participation is about working together. When we understand that diversity is the lifeblood of progress and prosperity, it becomes a nation's responsibility, and that includes all of us. Every sector and every citizen has something to offer. It is a varied, richly textured, and shaded fabric of diversity, not any single thread that provides durability and strength to our science and engineering enterprise, and thus to our nation. Diversity, once given scope and opportunity, has the potential to shape, to transform, and to drive our future for the better. So we need to spend less of our intellectual capital worrying about supply and demand, and invest more in getting on with the task of transforming the nation's diversity into our strongest asset. The prize here, the treasure trove of diversity, is clearly worth the effort. So thanks very much. I have to find my slides, but while I'm trying to do that, let me uh, say how much I enjoyed working with Neil. Uh, there are many things I could say, but I especially remember uh, the great collaboration between the National Academies and his office when we were dealing with the early stages of the Government Performance Results Act, which could have had really disastrous effects on basic science. And uh, we, we had a great committee, a great report, but it was Neil who really made that uh, uh, the difference and, and got it to the highest levels of government, and I think it turned out very well. 
uh, we, we like him so much, he's actually chairing a very simple committee for us. <laughs> the simple, very simple question, how do you transport high-level radioactive waste 3,000 miles from the East Coast to the West Coast to a repository, uh, should one open up? And so we're looking forward to the answer, Neil. <laughs> uh, Neil, of course, uh, coined the phrase the, the citizen scientist, and he certainly also is the exemplar of that kind of a scientist. Uh, I, I want to talk today uh, about the, what uh, we in the National Academies are trying to do on the very important issue uh, that Shirley talked about with a focus on, uh, on how we're going to educate uh, our, our citizens more effectively to both create more and better scientists and engineers, but also better citizens. Uh, I, since this is being webcast, I thought I'd say something that uh, at the beginning that uh, everybody in this audience knows, but our National Academy of Sciences was incorporated during the time of Abraham Lincoln, and we had a special charter which made all the difference. Uh, as a private organization in Washington, we needed a charter at that time, and we could only exist as this honorary association if, in fact, we were willing to advise the uh, government on any matter of science or technology, and of course, the famous phrase, without any compensation whatsoever, uh, led to uh, the fact that we're a great uh, service organization today with some 6,000 volunteers at any one time, including Neil, <laughs> uh, on panels. And we call ourselves today the National Academies because my colleague Bill Wolf here, the president of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, and uh, also an Institute of Medicine, uh, three honorary societies were formed under the same charter, something like 5,000 members, and then the, during World War I, the National Research Council allowed us to bring in teachers, uh, lawyers, whatever else we needed on these committees, which at their core are scientific, but really have grassroots uh, information uh, brought from the front lines. Uh, we're very uh, useful to Washington only because we are independent. Uh, even though the government pays, uh, we are recognized as giving independent advice. We don't negotiate the answer to these questions the government poses. We release the report to the uh, government and to the public at the same time on our website. Uh, two kinds of reports. Most of them are really how we use science for policy, arsenic in drinking water, what are the dangers. But, but many are also policy for science, which is what I'm talking about today. And our most difficult ever policy for science report were the National Science Education Standards, a task handed to us uh, initially from the 50 governors uh, under the, the guidance of uh, then Governor Clinton, uh, said we are in trouble in this country, we need some national voluntary standards for our basic core subjects. Uh, the, the task bounced around for quite a while. And then with the support of the National Science Foundation and the Department of Education, we took this thing on. I came midway into the task, 1993, as president of the Academy, and I could tell you how difficult it was. I spent half of my time for the next two years uh, working on this. You could see it had 18,000 reviewers. It took us a year to deal with the reviews. So it turned out, uh, I think, very well. It does have an important vision, uh, guiding principles that science is for all students. Learning science requires active engagement. School science should reflect professional science. It basically calls for a revolution in the way we've traditionally taught science, both in the K-12 level, lower levels, and, as I'll emphasize, in the first few years of college. Uh, the standards were organized in the various chapters, and the one I'd like everybody to read is only 25 pages is about teaching because uh, teaching is an incredibly difficult and important art. Several people have said today things I fully support. We have to, uh, everything depends on the quality of our teachers and how we support them, and we, we have to be more sophisticated about we, what we think teaching is, because there are many simplistic ideas about what's required. Uh, because uh, we're talking about a revolution, we produced a series of uh, supplements. One uh, very important was about inquiry. What is inquiry? How does it look in the classroom at various levels? And the model for this whole crusade is every child a scientist, which, by which we mean every child getting the abilities to use logic and evidence and, and argue like a scientist, not that they will turn out to be a scientist. Well, this is the image we want for science. This is a, the Einstein statue in our, our front yard, and uh, this is the image we all want for science, and that is the connection, the gap we have to fill. Uh, I would argue that the, one of the important places we could fill that is in our classrooms. Uh, we, we have to make science exciting and accessible, and we know how to do it, we just don't do it in many places. 
the good news is that inquiry-based science education pre precisely fits the needs for workforce skills that have been widely expressed over and over again by U.S. business and industry. So we have a strong ally in this movement, potentially, if we could mobilize that ally and get them sophisticated enough to really be part of this struggle. Uh, here's a quote from Bob Galvin, the former CEO of Motorola. While most descriptions of necessary skills for children do not list learning to learn, this should be the capstone skill upon which all others depend. Memorize facts, which are the basis for most testing done in schools today, are of little use in the age in which information is doubling every two or three years. We have expert systems and computers and the internet that can provide the facts we need when we need them. Our workforce needs to utilize facts to assist in developing solutions to problems. Now, Motorola should know because they've been hiring many for years, hiring high school graduates who weren't qualified. As a result, on their Schomburg campus, they set up something called Motorola University. So this comes out of their long experience with, with what they need even for uh, the workforce uh, uh, at, at lower levels, not to mention the leaders, of course. Uh, the bad news is uh, my favorite slide, inertia. We have incredible inertia in our systems, and, and as I'll emphasize, the universities are a major part of this. The scientific societies are a major part of this. It's not just them, it's us. They're all in this together. Here's a, a, a diagram that comes from a report from the National Academies several years ago about our education system, all the interacting forces. Now, many of my members will blame anybody but us for this problem. It's the textbook publishers, it's the unions, you know, we can't do anything until we fix any one of these problems. But I started as a chemist, this is an equilibrium diagram, and uh, we can't solve this problem at any one point. And I want to especially emphasize that, or, that, uh, that the, uh, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, especially since I'm at a university here, the, the science professors, which I was for 30 years, who most of us think we have nothing to do with this problem, it's somebody else's problem. Now, of course, when you think about it more carefully, and it was emphasized by Shirley, uh, Colleges define what science teaching is, what science education is, and we're misdefining it by our poor performance in our early science courses. Now, I'm a biologist, and biology may be the worst, because every year the amount of information in biology goes up by 30%. We still try to teach all that one year in many or most colleges. Textbooks are enormously wide and fat, and uh, it, the, the, the way we define science in our big lecture classes has nothing to do with the definition of science that we came up with in National Science Education Standards. And so at a minimum, we need to fix the first few years of college if we're going to really make this revolution happy, happen. This is something I've learned in trying a lot of other things in the last 10 years. <laughs> Uh, this means inquiry-based teaching of science in its relation to society for all students and changing those cookbook laboratories that we force students through into some kind of experience with inquiry, especially in the research universities. Every student, I believe, should have some uh, involvement with inquiry during their freshman year just to acquaint them with what we really want in the way of uh, educational performance. Uh, this is a, a vision for introductory science courses were published by the Academy several years ago. The National Science Foundation published a, a similar report at the same time. We've been working closely with the National Science Foundation on all these issues. The hardest thing to change, in my view, are college professors. <laughs> I, I was a department chairman at two different universities. So I, I, I should have known that from the begin, <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> uh, so uh, may, how are we going to change? Uh, well. Uh, We've realized that we need to get evidence. A major mission for us now is making a science out of education. Uh, we need to know exactly what are the effects of these large lecture courses in biology on, on causing many of the best students to drop out of science. And, and we are losing half of the students in, in, right there in the first few years of college. And studies show that these are not the worst students. These are students of talent, equally talented to those who stay in. Uh, so if our faculty, uh, the science faculty especially, uh, ha had uh, clear evidence that we could present to them in a meaningful way, I, I have to believe that they would act on, on this. Uh, an important uh, report we did uh, set off this agenda is a report called How People Learn, Brain, Mind, Experience in School. It basically takes the last 30 years of what we've learned about learning in academia, in psychology departments, and elsewhere, and it says, what are the implications of what we know from that scholarship to schools? And 
And uh, strangely enough, uh, this translation generally has not been made. The world of academia has been disconnected from the world of our schools. So to create a continuously improving education system, we need a more effective system of education research. I agree completely with the, Tom. Uh, focus on classroom settings, not just education research in theory, but focus on what's actually happening in classrooms. It's critical that as in science, we accumulate a commonly accepted body of knowledge based on confirmable evidence. Otherwise, we have what we have today. Uh, every new leader of the school system has their own program. The teachers are jerked around every which direction. Uh, you cannot build an education system on politics, and that's what we're trying to do today. I'm from California, I should know. <laughs> <laughs> so what is good research in education? This is an important report published by the National Academy. It's called Scientific Research in Education. If you're interested in this question, it's a wonderful short report. You may not believe this, but this is a very hot issue, a political debate in Washington right now, which is kind of amazing. Who would have believed it? And uh, I, I think this report is a, uh, is, should, should set the standard for what people think about this important topic. Uh, urgently needed are more research and teaching sciences inquiry in school classrooms. Part of the reason why we have trouble moving our agenda forward is that we don't have enough evidence about what works, why, and, what, what, and how we could do a better job of implementation, as well as what the effects are on the long-term attitudes of children and their abilities from this kind of science teaching. We have lots of anecdotes. We need to do a much better job of collecting evidence. So I want to end this talk by uh, a little personal note. <laughs> Uh, I really care deeply about this problem. I've been working on this for 10 years. I came to the academy. I did, let me back up for a second. I was sitting at the University of California having a wonderful time as a, a professor at UCSF. They asked me whether I wanted to run for, or be considered as a candidate for president of the National Academy of Sciences. This was 1992. I said no. <laughs> so in, 1990, uh, in the fall of 1992, they came to me and said, I know you didn't want to be considered for this, but we chose you anyway. Uh, just come and talk to us about this. Uh, and they convinced me to do this because I cared deeply about science education. I had been working with the San Francisco School. So my view was, uh, you know, I come to the academy and I could do this thing. Well, it's been 10 years, and uh, I only got two years left to solve this problem. So I hope all of you out there are going to help me, because uh, there are lots of problems we have. And this is based on a lot of uh, my own personal uh, thinking. I'm going to give you three major issues that I think are at the center of this debate. First of all, there's a question of tests. We all believe in accountability, but to a great extent, nobody differentiates between one kind of test or another kind of test. And if you test fifth grade scientists, as we're now doing, fifth grade scientists we're now doing in my district school, public schools in San Francisco, uh, with a multiple choice science fact list, then you will get a kind of science te teaching that will drive everybody out of science. They'll hate it. And that image of all those kids on Einstein, you forget about it. They don't, uh, and, and that's where we've been from many, many years. If you had a different kind of test which tests kids for how they can solve problems, well, uh, we might drive this system in, in a different way. Every state is required to have a set of high stakes science assessments in place by the 2007-2008 school year. That's part of No Child Left Behind. Who's giving feedback from the real world of the schools to the people who make policy to, to let them know whether this is working or not? We don't have a system of feedback in, a, in our education system. Second, second of all, uh, the US business community, in my view, has been quite ineffective uh, in, in advocating for their own interests. Th they really remain largely ignorant about the two different kinds of science education I'm describing. They want more and better high, high, uh, science education, but they don't discriminate between multiple choice tests for accountability and, and, the, and, and a kind of testing or, or, or set of standards that would really produce the kind of citizens and workforce that Bob Galvin needs. Uh, so this leaves science education vulnerable to political and economic forces that continue to buffet the system and they threaten our long-term national security. I just came back from 10 days in China. They have got their act together. Uh, they're using our national science education standards. <laughs> they may have printed more translations than we have uh, in English. Uh, that country is moving in a uniform, focused direction. Science and technology is at the center of their economic and political development. From the, very, from the president on down, every mayor, uh, you know, we have got to get our act together here. 
Uh, the last thing that keeps me up at night <laughs> is that our best science teachers, and there are many of them out there, need to have much more influence on the education system. Current trends, the kind of testing I'm talking about, other things, uh, workloads, will drive our talented teachers into more lucrative and respected careers. Uh, their influence is needed at every level, from the national le level all the way to the state and district level. Right now, our best teachers have almost no voice in any decisions that are made about our education system. So the question to me has been for the last couple of years, how can we institutionalize such an influence? And that's since the only way we could create some stability and wisdom to create what we will all want is a continuously improving education system. And this is our new experiment uh, as of a little over a year. You, uh, a teacher advisory council at the National Academies, these are teachers the best, some of the best teachers in the, the nation, 12 of them. Uh, they're spending their, at least half their time in, in the classroom. They're not former teachers. And here, here's a, a group of uh, incredible, energetic, and uh, wonderful people who uh, were the reason why I was late getting to the meeting yesterday. We, we had our meeting in Washington. I promised them I'd be there. Uh, and uh, the, we are work, trying to work and see what we can do with them. The, the, the mission of this group in the broadest sense is to provide a much stronger voice for our nation's best science, mathematics, and technology teachers in national education policies. This will also require, and this is one of my goals, is to connect these kinds of teachers to the business and industry leaders so that we could get uh, all our uh, forces in line to, to try to, to really move this agenda in an effective way. Uh, this Teacher Advisory Council has met about four or five times. They, they're recommending now that we uh, create state councils uh, to pro provide a, a voice for teachers at the state level where a lot of the policies are made, or most of them, and connect them to this national group. And I'll just end with our website, which uh, we uh, are very proud of and put a lot of resources in and are, are making a great attempt to connect uh, the resources we have, especially for teachers, uh, to, to, to the uh, national effort to improve education everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have time for some questions. We don't have much time. Uh, quick and skinny. Michael Carroll from Rice University. Uh, two very quick comments and, and then a question. My first comment is the um, assumption that the best in years for an engineer or scientist are the early years. <laughs> I would like to take serious issue with that. <laughs> if it were true, we would not celebrate birthdays. <laughs> uh, my second comment is uh, the various tributes to Neil Lane. I had the pleasure of serving with Neil for five years when I came to Rice as Dean of Engineering and he was Provost. Uh, we've heard a lot about the iron fist in the velvet glove. Most of the comments have been about the glove. Uh, if any of you want to know about the iron fist, come and see me later, I'll show you the scar. Uh, my question, which I would preface by saying, I've heard some very positive things from the panel, um, has to do with the pipeline issue, K through 12. Uh, I've been involved with a group called HENAC, uh, Hispanic Engineers National Achievement Awards Corporation, which is one of many, many groups dealing with this issue. They provide role models such as my colleague Richard Tapia, who's a member of the Hall of Fame, was HENAC Engineer of the Year. They have a wonderful program called Viva Technology that involves teachers, parents, students, computers, uh, it's growing, doubling every year in terms of funding. But again, I think it's one of maybe 30 different things that are going on. Uh, my question basically is, is it time for some coordination, some leadership, some identification of winners and losers, some investment in improvement, assessment, and so on? And if so, who should provide that and who co can provide that leadership and coordination? So who on the panel would like to talk about that? Joe? Yes, yeah, that's, uh, uh, Michael, it's good to see you again. <laughs> uh, that's exactly what I was talking about with this priority area uh, or initiative, as uh, Tom used the word. Uh, this is a, to, an effort to uh, integrate across the uh, many different investments by lots of different people in pieces. And so there'll be competitions now. Uh, this has three parts to it. One is uh, integrative institutional collaborations. 
it's a fancy name for what you're talking about, and to get the money in a competition to those of a track record by having them integrate somehow and compete and try to get the best of them to accelerate their productivity in this area. The second part, the three parts, second part is faculty for the future, and we're talking about K to professors. We decided not to say teachers and faculty. We decided to say faculty. They're all faculty. They're all one group to get them to mix together well in a variety of ways. And the third has to do with research that uh, was talked about here from the Academy of Sciences. So this is an effort which is very holistic, it's connective, and to try to ferret out those things that work best and accelerate them. Okay. Another question? Um, Greg Canavan, Los Alamos. I guess my question is to uh, Dr. Khalil. I, I found your discussion of initiatives very interesting, but initiatives are kind of hard to do. Uh, and I wondered if maybe you had some suggestions as to how you would implement them. For instance, uh, th there was a criticism this morning of DARPA that it's now, it, it, it does initiatives very well and it pushes initiatives out and new initiatives in the Department of Defense, but is doing them on a, on a time scale which is way short compared to a PhD degree. So how would you efficiently implement the sort of initiatives you were talking about? Well, I think one thing that needs to be done is, is to indicate from the very beginning uh, that some of the goals of the initiative are going to take a long time. So when, when uh, President Clinton gave a speech on, on nanotechnology at Caltech, he was very careful to say some of the goals of the initiative that I'm talking about may take 10 or 20 years to achieve, which is why there's an appropriate role for the federal government. So I think that in terms of structuring these, I think it's important to have a, a, a portfolio approach where you maybe identify some things that are going to happen in the near term, but you also uh, identify some of the longer term challenges that are going to require sustained support for fundamental science and engineering. Okay, another question. Um, Michelle Scherer, Rice University. And my question or com comment and question is really about college and graduate degrees in the programs. I think it's all well and good to get our young K through 12 excited about science, but I feel that when they reach the university system, that the university system is failing them. We talk about professional development, but often that professional development does not begin until well after the degree, and you've already been compelled to choose a career path with no professional development. So I'd like your remarks about how we might be able to incorporate more professional development at the beginning of a degree program instead of at the end. Uh, well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what fuels your, but this gives me a chance to say something about a, a Texas program that I think is a very good model. It's the University of Texas Austin has a program called You Teach. Uh, in the Department of Natural, in the Division of Natural Sciences for science and mathematics majors who are thinking about being teachers. And, and, and this program uh, might be a good model for any other kind of field you want to talk about. Uh, basically, they incentivize students by giving them free uh, credits if they, if they want, all the science and math majors, if the, the, the first year they want to come in and, and take a, uh, I think it's like four hours a week to, to take them out in the schools to actually see what science teaching is like with some of the best teachers in the area. Uh, getting them familiar with what it would be like to be a science or math teacher before they actually commit to their major and their, their plans. And that continues throughout the whole program. It's a four-year program which I think produces about 100 sciences and math teachers a year. It, it, it's, uh, it's the kind of thing that I think makes a lot of sense in many other areas. It was really designed not only by the professors, but in a very unusual move, they brought in some of the best teachers, best professionals uh, uh, in the area to help them for several years think about how they were going to design this program, and that's what resulted. So you could think about the same kind of program in many other areas. You bring in professionals in the profession to try to design a program that would very early on in the college years uh, acquaint uh, prospective uh, people who might go, want to go in that profession, what the profession is like. In, in education, as somebody said, I guess Duncan said this, you know, half of the people who get education degrees decide by the time they get the degree they don't want to teach. I mean, this is crazy. It's a waste of resources. I, uh, and so uh, some closer connection between our universities and uh, career uh, prospects uh, would make a lot of sense with regard to people's making of this, the right decisions early uh, so that they, uh, they, they make the appropriate investments in their education. 
Okay, may okay. I follow up? Yeah. Okay, sure. One of the things that I have found, though, is that, um, especially being a non-traditional student coming from business into science, is that there's an overwhelming mindset amongst research-based science, research universities, that the professors are training future professors, oh, well. not future scientists. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to say that the Academy has obviously failed. We've been working on this for <laughs> about eight years. We have a little booklet called uh, Careers for uh, Graduate Student and Beyond the Careers in Science and Technology. And then, then after that, uh, making this point, and then after that, after I was invited to all these graduate student uh, symposia on Saturday, Saturdays, uh, where, where the graduate students told me, well, the problem is that I want to be this or that, use it with my science degree. Not, but, but I don't dare tell my professor because the professor will disown me and won't pay any attention to me after. So then we produced this little uh, book called Advisor, Mentor, Teacher, Friend on being a, uh, a, a mentor to sciences and sci uh, students in science and technology. And we, knowing it's all up on the web, but knowing that the professors will never read it, uh, we suggest that students actually buy this very small, inexpensive book and put it on the professor's chair in the middle of the night. <laughs> and uh, obviously not enough people have been doing that, so let's sell some more books. <laughs> okay, Joe, you want Let me to try to give a more um, um, uh, uh, leverage kind of uh, answer to this, because I was having trouble understanding what your question was, because it has many meanings. But NSF has two criteria that all proposals have to be reviewed against. And uh, one of them, of course, is what's the intellectual value of all of this and so on. And the other one, what's the greater impact of it? And uh, that greater impact has uh, many little ticks under it that you can do. Uh, you can concentrate on diversity. You can produce uh, some infrastructure might be useful across the nation. It's a greater impact of what your work is. And, uh, and one has to do with uh, getting into the kind of thing you're talking about. There are many things you can have greater impact. One is to have greater impact on the student's career by being more professional and so on. So there are ways for professors to write and get, get money uh, to do some of these things. But the problem you've got is a huge one. I mean, there are still many faculty members who still believe the, their only job is to make more faculty members and they should practice birth control. You should have, you can, you can train one to replace yourself and that's it. Well, let's talk about something that happened under Neil's watch. I think we changed from PYI or to career, faculty or career development. And um, um, Shirley mentioned it this morning as one of the things that's sort of uh, torquing the system. Uh, one is it's a very young person starting off can get some startup money uh, by competing. But you have to integrate research and education, and you have to do a lot of these things <laughs> we're talking about to get this award. And that program, what it isn't, you know, what it isn't, isn't, what it isn't is just starting off a single investigator in research. What it is is creating a faculty member for the 21st century academe who is the kind of person you're talking about here. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Uh, Duncan Moore, uh, given the statistics you have, especially on the physical science, would it be very uh, almost impossible for the, especially the physical science, to absorb any significant increases in research and development given the state of the, of the population? And secondly, won't the recent reported increases in tuition across the country exacerbate that? Well, with the f second one first, um, probably, but it's going to hurt, hurt. I'm not sure it's going to hurt science any more disproportionately than any other field. It's gonna, I think it's going to hurt all fields. Um, I'm sorry, what was the first question? Are there enough physicists oh, to absorb physicists. the money? Yeah. The, <laughs> you know, when I looked at one of uh, Jack's view graphs this morning on the, on the Apollo program, and the number, that big bubble of people, at least 50% of the people in this room came through the science or got excited about science during that period because students follow the money. And if there's a lot of excitement over a program, students will move into it. And so the question I actually was thinking about asking Jack was, is there any way, short of having some huge program like Apollo, that we'll actually get a lot of students to go into the field? If we continue along with the 10% solution, will we just keep going that way and there's, there's no way out of it? Would you like to answer? I've seen a very impressive graph uh, emerge during the last couple of months that I, th I think Bert Richter showed it to me the first time, and it was uh, two graphs. The first was the uh, total federal investment in uh, physical <coughs> science and engineering 
uh, re research. And the second one was the number of baccalaureate degrees in engineering and physical science. And they track. And they're not just a, a simple curves. They have a lot of structure in them, and the structure is the same in both curves. That, that, I found that to be very encouraging. It means that if you make an investment uh, in these areas, then you will create students. I do think there's a lot of untapped uh, capacity in the physical science departments. Uh, universities are currently carrying uh, faculty sizes uh, to, to serve large numbers of uh, service courses, and it, it would not be difficult at all to double uh, or, or significantly increase the number of undergraduate majors in the physical sciences uh, given current resources. That, that's my view. Thank you, and thank the panel. <laughs> thank you all very much. We're going to be changing topics again now. Um, I'd like to ask uh, whoever it was that was going to change the name tags up here. This would be a good time to do it. And now I would like to introduce our next distinguished speaker, Dr. Norman Newrider, who I think most of you know was the Science and Technology Advisor for the Secretary of State, a position that many of us in the scientific community worked very hard to have established. And I was serving as the president of the IIIS while the Academy was doing its report on this issue. And we were all very pleased when Norm was chosen to be the um, Science and Technology Advisor to Secretary Madeleine Al Albright, and then followed through to be the advisor to our current Secretary, Colin Powell. He left the position only a few months ago, so he's probably still trying to recover from Pot Potomac fever. Um, and prior to this, he had a very distinguished career, and he worked at Texas Instruments and was the Vice President of um, TI Asia. So Norm, um, we would be delighted to hear from you now. And then we'll have some questions, a few questions for Dr. Neurider, and then I'll, uh, the, I'm, because I also am going to have to la leave, Bob <laughs> Curl's gonna take over, introduce the panel, and go on from there, okay? Great, Marcy, thanks so much. Well, listen, it's a real pleasure to be included in this distinguished group, and I'm pleased, in fact, that um, Anyone still interested in what I might have to say? Rosine, I want to thank you especially for inviting me. And I must say, I really liked the first part of that email you sent, which, which read something like, um, you don't really have to prepare much of anything for this meeting, uh, until I read the next line, which said, because Norm Newright is going to give the plenary talk, and all you other people have to do is make some, make some comments. Well, I saw her last week in Washington. I said, Rosine, you know, I am really busy adjusting to retirement. And I don't have a lot of time to prepare on this. And she said, well, don't worry. Most of the people are taking early planes, so it's no problem. <laughs> In any case, I'm really grateful to those of you who held out. And uh, I appreciate your being here, even if you just dropped in for a postprandial snooze. <laughs> Let me start with a few words of appreciation and thanks. Neil, your recommendation and support had a lot to do with my being selected by Secretary Albright for, <coughs> for, as her S&T advisor. And it was the first such position in the history of the State Department. It has been a great job, and it's definitely kept me off the streets, out of my wife's garden on a more or less 24-7 basis for the last three years. Now, you know, it's always exciting to be the first at anything. There's kind of no benchmark to measure you against. But it's also a job where every day, literally every day, there was some new issue, some new contact, new challenge, or new opportunity to deal with. Now, it was also sometimes frustrating. The caprice of government decision-making, also known in my office as the one issue weenie effect, <laughs> can at times really get to you. It was never boring, but I, and I just love this job. On my final interview, in fact, just two months before the 2000 election, after a brief chat with Secretary Albright, where it was pretty apparent I had the job, her chief of staff finished up the interview by saying, by the way, don't sell your house in Dallas. <laughs> well, I looked at her, put my hand in her eye, and said, lady, I don't need this job. And my wife doesn't particularly want me to take it, but if you offer it to me, I cannot resist. I have been in training for this for 40 years. Anyway, Jack, I must also thank you. Jack Givens, I must also thank you. You were acting as a part-time advisor at State after leaving the White House. And you warned me that I was about to enter what you called the most technophobic culture you had ever seen. 
But also, even before I was appointed, you invited me to give a speech to an NAE symposium on Earth Systems Engineering. And that happened to come on my 35th day on the job, and I titled the speech, It's the World, Stupid. <laughs> and I stole that title from William Sapphire and was trying to make the point that in a world of inordinate disorder, America remained the only credible bearer of the mantle of global leadership. And yet how sad it was that the election campaign of that year was essentially devoid of any mention of foreign policy, despite Jim Lehrer's valiant efforts during one of the debates to raise such issues. And I still think my comments <coughs> in that talk were right on target, but when I opened the Washington Post last Sunday to an article with the headline in the Outlook section, with the headline, this election has foreign affairs written all over it, I realized how much things have changed in America in the last three years. Foreign policy is very much at the top of America's agenda today. But Jack, with your invitation, you also gave me an introduction to a key audience of supporters at the National Academies. And the support for our work at State from those institutions under Bruce Alberts, Bill Wolf, Ken Schein, Harvey Feinberg, has remained steadfast and rock solid up until this day. And that attitude was contagious. There's been tremendous support and interest from AAAS, many professional societies, the university science and engineering community, and from the technical agencies of the US government. In other words, the outreach process to the S&T community is really in fine shape, has been in great shape. Jack Marburger, I also got to thank you and your staff at OST for the terrific cooperation you gave our office, clearly with its overall role in S&T policy and with its director, you in effect serving as the S&T Minister of the United States, OSTP's support and sustained support must be an essential part of whatever we try to do at State in the area of S&T. Now our basic mission uh, derived from this NAS NRC seminal study in 1999 on science technology excuse me, science, technology, and foreign policy. And <clears throat> that mission was basically to strengthen states' capacity to fully integrate science and technology considerations into the formation of US foreign policy. Now, I'd like to be able to tell you that <clears throat> you can simply do this by whispering in the secretary's ear. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. So I decided if we were going to penetrate the heart of Jack Gibbon's country of technophobiania, we needed to have more scientists in the system than our three-person office could ever have. And so we focused on getting more scientists in the system through expansion of fellowship programs. The greatest increase was in the AAAS program, but the American Institute of Physics, IEEE, are also providing science fellows to state and the American Chemical Society and the Industrial Research Institute have just gotten on board and will have fellows in the future year. This fall, and someone was nice enough to mention it this morning, we in fact do have 40 PhD scientists all over that building, spread among 16 of the bureaus, including five of the six regional bureaus, which is the absolute heart of the department, and where that technophobic heart beats the strongest, I guess you well know, <laughs> right? And my successor, George Atkinson, <coughs> Uh, is putting the final touches on a new Jefferson Science Fellows program that he's worked out with funding from private foundations and universities and which will add more fellows by next fall. We also put a focus on getting <coughs> science students into our summer intern program. We've gotten more scientists detailees in the state from other agencies and a special program in which NSF was the first participant is placing over 30 scientists a year from technical agencies of the US government into tailored one to three month assignments in embassies overseas. I happen to think that's a terrific program because in an embassy, the ambassador really sees the immediate impact on the host society of having more interchange with that element, that important element in the other society, the scientific and the technical community. Now, the reason fellows are so important is that they represent distributed wisdom around the building. State is a really complex institution of 26 bureaus, six of them geographic bureaus covering all the regions and 191 countries of the world. They oversee some 270 embassies and consulates staffed by the foreign service officers that Secretary Powell calls 
the front line of national security. The other bureaus are functional bureaus, that is, focused on specific issue areas, arms control, nonproliferation, oceans, environment, science, consular affairs, educational and cultural exchanges, administration, political, military affairs, and so on. Rarely do purely scientific issues go to the Secretary of State. Big political issues go there. North Korea, the global AIDS epidemic, the Iranian nuclear issue, Iraq reconstruction, and so on. Now, often different bureaus have very different views on the policy issues at hand. Also, quite often, s and is an element in these big issues. That was the big point of the Academy study. But if the s and considerations are not made at the bureau or office level, as those policy documents float up through the system, the chances of affecting policy at the end of the line are very slim, or at least they're not very good. And for the first time this fall, we're going to have a senior physics professor, well, he's there now, a senior physics professor working on ITAR export control issues in the Political Military Affairs Bureau, one of the AIP fellows. The staff even calls him, he tells me, they call him Doc. Isn't <laughs> now, <laughs> right, how about that? Now, this area, if any of you are in space research, you know the problem that ITAR has called in our, in our university space research. It's a terrible problem. And this is, <clears throat> and it's been a huge source of difficulty for university space program people who try to employ foreign students or foreign cooperators in these, in these programs, particularly if they build, if they build uh, satellites with a company. And it's a deemed export problem. And hopefully the AIP fellow can make some constructive contributions. And we literally worked on this problem with NASA for two years. They finally came out with new regulations and the university still can't effectively function with those regs. So those were the two pieces of our program, the outreach and the and the fellows, and the third one was to select some specific science initiatives, which in my judgment could demonstrate the direct value of s and to achievement of certain political objectives with other countries. It was kind of a foreign service personnel consciousness raising exercise to demonstrate the potential value of s and as an active element of foreign policy. Now, just before mentioning an example or two of that, let me just say a word about the world we were facing. I spent nearly 30 years in two, two large corporations, one in petroleum, one in electronics. And the big corporate world has really hardly embraced globalization. And Jack, you mentioned this in a way this morning. Mergers and alliances, especially in high-tech industries, are just de rigueur today. Exxon and Mobil were not big enough alone to address the mobile marketplace. So now my $83 per month Exxon retirement check comes from the Exxon Mobil Corporation. HP, and I mentioned this to, to John Young, he's gone now, but I said HP and Compaq were either too big to have to compete with each other or not big enough to compete in the global market, and so they merged. You know, that wasn't without a lot of fuss, but nonetheless, they did, they did bring it off. <clears throat> but now look at the political world. How different is it? They haven't bought into this at all. Their centrifugal forces prevail. Ethnic tensions, nationalist ambitions, religious extremism, economic competition continue to divide the world's people at a remarkable rate. As corporate entities get bigger and bigger, the political entities get smaller and smaller. That's why we have nearly 200 countries in the world. And these instruments of division can be democratic, but increasingly they're not. They're violent. They're fueled by passionate convictions, <coughs> convictions that emerge as terrorism or suicidal attacks. And the point is, the political world is therefore very different from the business world, and business solutions and market forces are by no means the complete answer to those problems. Now, we're all struggling to find the right answers to these questions, and in doing so, to protect our own country and citizens in the process. And you simplified this somewhat this morning. I simplified it this morning by saying it was the issue of globalization versus terrorism. And of course, that is the challenge we face. So what were the specific projects that struck me as having political value for the regional bureaus or country desks? Well, one was the formation and implementation of the Indo-US S&T Forum. 
And of course, Neil, that had grown out of those two dialogues, high-level dialogues, which you had with the Indian science community. And that became a major policy objective of Ambassador Celeste in India. And although a modest rupee endowment had been provided and an agreed framework set up, nothing had happened. The U.S. administration changed. All the presumed board members left on January 19, and the money was about to be lost. Well, with strong support, and there really was strong support from our South Asia Bureau and the embassy, I stepped in and set up a, <coughs> a somewhat lower level U.S. board and arranged a first meeting with the Indian counterparts. And now for three years, I've served as co-chairman of the forum with strong secretarial support from the National Academy. And Bruce, I'm greatly indebted to you for that. Um, and in this way, we have sustained a formal mechanism for bilateral S&T cooperation with India. Now, this happens to fit very well with present US policy toward India, which stresses cooperation, encourages <laughs> their economic and scientific development, and has relaxed some of the sanctions which were imposed on India after their nuclear tests. The Indians particularly want more cooperation in nuclear power, civil space activity, and easing of export controls on high technology items. In the bureaucratic world, this is now called the Trinity issues in the, in the India relationship. <clears throat> now, some relaxation continues, but there are proliferation concerns, they remain and to a lesser extent, intellectual property concerns also limit the relationship with the Indians. On the other hand, the forum is working, and it is considered a meaningful part of the new and much warmer relationship of the US with India. Now, when President Bush met with President Musharraf in Washington almost two years ago, in addition to arrangements to fight terrorism and to provide assistance in education and economic development, they also suggested, they also expressed a joint desire to develop cooperation in science and technology. This was of great interest to the embassy, uh, our embassy out there, and also to the Pakistan desk, and when no one else picked this up in the US government, our office did so. Now, working with Pakistan's very impressive Minister of Science, Atta Rahman, we laid out a framework for a cooperative program, and after a year's beating on them, I finally secured $2 million from AID to implement this program. The Pakistanis put in half a million, and when I went out there to visit, they raised it to one million on their side. On the same visit, the U.S. ambassador and I were received by President Musharraf, and we spent nearly 40 minutes with him talking about what a, a greater scientific relationship with the U.S would mean to the economic development and the future of Pakistan. Well, all of this happened four months ago, and nothing else has happened. Even though we had an s and agreement signed actually by Nazios of AID while Musharraf was in the country, um, and even though money was committed by AID and gave to the State Department to run this program, Spending of this aid money has been blocked by a single staff member in the Congress. And it's just, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the program. He likes the program, but it's because states should not be using assistance funds. States should only be using environment, or, uh, economic support funds, ESF funds. Now, that is pure bureaucraties, but it's a very important issue to someone. And in the meantime, there's no money, no program, Right, high embarrassment on the U.S. side and negative political impact. Now, of course, we haven't given up. I'm a part-time consultant to the State Department, Jack, like you were. And uh, more graciously put, it reflects the caprice of decision-making. But in truth, it's a bit depressing. But that's my point. Nothing is done in government until it's really done. Nothing is, nothing is really sure. And science... As someone said, science is everybody's second priority, and that's, and that's an issue for us all. Anyway, I won't go through three or, more other, three or four more other examples, but Vietnam was one. We tried some things. We did something with Brazil that was really appreciated by the political folks. Did some things in Russia and Japan. Worked with the Arab Science and Technology Foundation in the UAE, and so on. But I am going to give one more example. I think our office rode the coattails of... of uh, Jack Marburg and Ray Orbach in the successful effort to get the U.S. to rejoin ITER, the ITER consortium, the, uh, the, uh, fusion, the uh, experimental thermonuclear reactor, sort of a critical way station on hopefully the 
the road to fusion energy. Um, China and South Korea have also joined now with Japan, the EU, and Russia, though Canada's a little uncertain today. But the consortium is really at a very critical stage in the decision process on siting and cost sharing. Now, to me, this happens to be an extremely important test case for the viability of the big multinational science or technology project. Can five nations in one region really come together and work for 10 years to build a reactor and then to continue to cooperate in operations for an additional 10 or 20 years? Can and will each of those national entities or regions compromise its own domestic fusion program, its domestic industry involvement, and agree to sustain funding at a work site which could be thousands of miles from home? Can the export control issues be worked? Can the IPR issues all be resolved in time to make this thing really happen in the coming year? You know, eater has been going on and been discussed. There's, of course, a redesign in the middle. But for 18 years, and we're approaching a time when firm decisions simply have to be made or it could founder. And that would be an enormous disappointment, at least to me personally, and I think an enormous disappointment for a very large community out there. It would furthermore imply a dim future for big science and big technology cooperation and would have unfortunate implications for the next generation of particle separate, uh, accelerator, which is of course a few years away. Anyway, I think it's a really interesting thing to watch and I think late in November as we move toward that, to the European decision on what position they're going to take on location and then how all that gets worked out with Japan, those are really the only two viable uh, places for the location of it at this time. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting thing, and we should know something very late in, in this month, I hope. Now, I have to confess something. I'm, a, I'm an inveterate engager in the science relationship with other countries. We're all prisoners of our own experience, and my own experience is in Poland and Eastern Europe, where during the Cold War we actively sought to keep channels open to the scientific community. We knew many people there who agreed with us and did not like their own governments. In the U.S. and uh, <clears throat> did the same thing with the Soviet Union via the Pugwash Conferences, the Academy's uh, CSAC Committee, and in fact an S&T agreement that was, initiated, that was negotiated on my dining room table in Bethesda with the Russians in 1972 prior to the Nixon-Brezhnev summit. Those engagements of our science communities in the 60s and 70s were, in my view, very instrumental in leading to the test, test ban treaty and other arms control agreements. All of these things were part of, in my view, the process of finding ways to keep us all from killing each other. Now, many people, in fact, don't believe very much in these kinds of engagements for the fear that we've been giving too much away and in some way are helping the enemy by these things. And admittedly, it is a trade-off and things are much more complex, or they aren't as bipolar, simply bipolar today as they were before. But I did always know it was interesting. People didn't want us to have contacts with the, the Russians or the Poles in those days, but it was really the Soviets who didn't want those contacts. They were the ones who tried to keep us away from their scientists. And then it was the Eastern European governments, particularly the Czechs and the Hungarians, because my Polish responsibility also included Czechoslovakia and Hungary. They really wanted us to keep, <laughs> to keep us away from their communities. Now this coming week I'm speaking at a major meeting on U.S.-China relations at Texas A&M. Uh, it's not well known, uh, I don't think, but when Henry Kissinger went to Beijing in 1972 to arrange President Nixon's breakthrough visit, he carried with him a collection of 40 possible cooperative S&T projects. And that was eventually laid before the Chinese as evidence that there was some tangible cooperative relationship which could emerge from the new political relationship which was being discussed with them and being offered to them. Now those 40 projects were cobbled together in great secrecy by me under Ed David's leadership, the one science advisor, former science advisor who's not here today, uh, with the help of a great team from OST. We had about 10 days to do it. The last three days and three nights were more or less continuous, but we did finish them. It was done with the help of the OST staff, 
and also the NAS Committee on Scholarly Communication with the PRC, and maybe some of you, in fact, remember that organization. Now, those proposals ultimately became the basis for exchanges and projects administered by the Academy until the formal signing of an intergovernmental agreement that was put together by Frank, Frank Press during the Carter administration. And that has involved into quite an incredible range of cooperative relationships with China today, including something between 60 and 70,000 students that are in US universities, and at least two thirds of those are in science and technology fields. Now, Bruce, you, you pointed out that you had just come back from China and the fantastic activity and energy and so on which you've seen there in your last presentation, you talked about science education in the meeting which was attended, Jack, you were just there. 3,000 people attended the meeting. The president of China sat there for much of the time and listened to the program and so on. It is a high priority in that country, and they're really driving forward. And <clears throat> I've seen the draft. Of, I'm, I'm keynoting a science section in this conference. And actually, Kissinger is supposed to, to kick it off at the beginning, and former President Bush will be the hoping it's at the Bush Library at, at A&M. And I've seen the speech from my Chinese counterpart, and they're going to complain about two things, the inadequate funding mechanisms on the US side for carrying on international relations, and furthermore, the desire to have some kind of forum, which I suspect would be a kind of binational US-China foundation. Anyway, we'll see what comes to that discussion. Uh, again, just, just to parallel with the Russian experience, this kind of close relationship in China, while I think it offers us a hopeful image of a future world is not popular with everyone in the United States. Again, some say, well, we're helping them to become stronger. Those S&T smarts can be applied to their military strength, and that has long-term negative implications to challenge the United States around the globe. Well, these relationships, interestingly, have been remarkably stable despite four or five major events. There was, of course, the Tiananmen incident, which kind of closed things down for a couple of years, but the science sort of went on. Then, then there was the accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. That was, uh, my son was in China at the time. That's when they burned one of the consulates and threw rocks through his window in the embassy. And, and um, <coughs> when the P3 went down, when the, when the spy plane was taken down a, a couple of years later, they were no much more than two years later, four years later. They, um, they had the folks under better control, and they, were, they, they, had, they had the demonstrations fully under control, and they didn't have them. And then, of course, the occasional saber rattling over Taiwan. And then finally, the Cox Report, where Boeing and Laurel have essentially, they've actually been formally charged, though it's all settled now, uh, with uh, transferring missile technology in the course of a joint satellite experiment, transferring middle missile technology to the Chinese. Anyway, all of those, all of those things have, have the, the science relationship has continued despite those perturbations in the system. But the point is the pluses and minus of the relation, uh, plus and minus dimensions of these relationships are much more complicated today after 9-11 than they, than they were before. On the other hand, it looks like the Chinese also appreciate the importance of, of joining us in, in this uh, battle against terrorism throughout the world. Now, this brings up another issue, this post 9-11 world that we're in, brings up another very key issue, uh, which came up this morning, uh, and which I happen to consider really one of the most serious barriers to our international S&T cooperation, and that's the visa problem. And we had quite a bit of discovery, a uh, discussion of that this morning. That, of course, derived from legislation which was passed in response to this 9-11 catastrophe. But let me put it in a slightly broader context. The military strength of the US is our hard power. No one can challenge us on the battlefield with our hard power. But there's another side to America, and that's our soft power. And it's sometimes called the co-opting power, as I think Joe Nye at Harvard has called it. It's this, it's this siren song of human rights, of an open society, of freedom of inquiry, of speech, of religion, all the elements of democracy. And our science and technology and our universities and the relationships that we build around the world are the instruments of that soft power. 
But what do you think the message is that our visa policies are sending today? Well, maybe they're saying thank you for sending 50% or more of our science and engineering students, physical science and engineering graduate students to the US over the last few years. Thanks for sending those 200,000 high-tech workers under the H-1B visa program. Thanks for sending postdocs to do research at NIH. There's 1,600 of them there from overseas. You come to work on diseases that, staff, that, <coughs> that afflict Americans. And thanks for sending people to staff the physics and chemistry labs at our university. Oh, but by the way, if you're from China or Russia or Eastern Europe or a Muslim country and you're a scientist and you want to study your work in the U.S., your chances of getting here aren't quite as good as they used to be. Now, I'm sure you've all got some horror stories, I know I do, of meetings missed and fellowships not accepted, some of the best and brightest going elsewhere. But you know, not the ambassador in the country, not our ambassador in country X, not Secretary Powell, no one can approve a visa for a scientist from many of these countries except a Washington Interagency Committee. So we tell everyone, be sure to apply three months ahead of time. But not everybody can do it, not everybody wants to do it, not everybody knows about his invitation that far ahead, and so often things don't work. And some of those people go to France and Australia and the UK and Germany and Japan, and those countries are very happy to have those brilliant young students who will be the future, the future of maybe Nobel Prize winners in the world. Now, the visa processing has improved and there's been progress and we keep working on this issue. And Jack, as you know, we spent a lot of time in, in, in our office on this issue too. But I think we're really depriving ourselves in the way we're presently managing this of one of our greatest foreign policy instruments. We are muffling the soft power message of these great United States. And this is a nation whose very essence rests on the principle of openness. Remember that Cold War movie, The Russians Are Coming? Well, there was an op-ed piece by the Russian ambassador Ushakov in the Washington Post last year. It was called, The Russians Are Not Coming. And it was about the visa problem. <laughs> well, anyway, because I am an engager, <clears throat> I actually hail the efforts of the NAS, frankly, with, with little or no support from the US government, to carry on its program of interaction with the Iranian Academy of Sciences. And you still have a series of workshops coming up, but as you know, you're essentially going to have to hold those outside the United States. But I still believe interaction with favorable elements in those countries is of value to us. And I can't help but believe that the engagements we carried on with Russia and Eastern Europe were important elements in the final collapse, were at least elements in the collapse of those regimes. You know, I once said this to a fellow from the, who had been with the CIA, and he says, are you kidding? I brought down the Soviet Union. Every piece of military equipment that went to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan went over my desk. That's what brought the Soviet Union to its knees. Well, I haven't seen him now for about 10 years. He's long since retired. Maybe he's right. Anyway, as a result, I see our international science cooperation really in a political context. And in addition to the above points, it's clearly one of our most powerful instruments for helping the developing world to begin to build an indigenous technical capacity for linking to the global economy, which in turn is ultimately driven by technology. And that's why the new study, maybe in a different color book, the new study that the NAS is the NRC are just now beginning on the role of science uh, in AID uh, maybe will have an impact on getting more science into that system. Despite a series of fits and starts over years to, to have s and really an identifiable and pervasive part of AIDS, AIDS activities, it still is not, even though many, many of their projects are fundamentally technology-based. Now, I, I'm, I'm supposed to stop pretty soon, right? <laughs> okay. But, the, but it goes till three o'clock, is that right? I just don't, I don't, I don't want to go too long. Anyway, let me, let me draw a few conclusions. It, it's obviously pretty clear that I really believe in this, in this whole area, and I hope to stay somewhat involved in it, uh, even in, this, <clears throat> in my, um, my retirement. And I believe in using our strength in these areas as instruments for building better relations around the world. Now, some of the reasons, and I've stolen a little bit of this from, from Jack Marburg, was, 
but certainly one of the reasons to address common problems of the modern world, just as we've been talking about today, to bridge this gap between science and, uh, and technology around the world. Energy, environment, infectious diseases, all of these issues are there. We want to draw on the best and brightest from around the world for the benefit of science and also to, to have them work in our facilities, which often are the best in the world, to increase the store of human knowledge. I think we want to apply our S&T skills to the challenge of sustainable development because we've heard how important the future of the developing countries is to the future of the world. But also to use our science as a carrier of American values of freedom and inquiry and, and entrepreneurship and to build strands of stability. This is slightly stolen from Kissinger, but I always liked it. To build strands of stability into the fabric of our relationships with other countries, in short, as an instrument of soft power. And of course, building uh, uh, ties to the intellectual and scientific communities in other countries, even where we have severe political disagreements, I think can be useful. There are some barriers. The visa problem we've talked about. I mentioned the export control problems, and those are issues. There's also a certain, uh, well, there's, there's one other thing. Policies limiting the ability to discuss even nuclear safety issues and anything related to nuclear safety. All of these things are prevented by the non-proliferation. And non-proliferation is a very dominant element in the foreign policy bureaucracy today. Very strong bureau in the department. The, the, the next one is the marginalization somewhat of these issues in the diplomatic community. And actually your study at the academy was an attempt to, well, in creating my job, it was an attempt to try to change the situation and bring these to the, <coughs> to the fore. Anyway, to make sure that that's well-rooted, we, we needs to keep after that. Intellectual property rights, I think, will increasingly be a problem in this area, particularly as universities uh, keep emphasizing gaining patents, having their own licensing offices, and so on. And then finally, linkage to other issues. That, Jack, as you know, has been a barrier in our relationship with Russia. In the darkest days of the Cold War, we were doing high energy physics cooperation with Russia. And although we finally got agreement to go ahead and we've given them a new protocol, for what, five years that's been essentially stopped. Fortunately, it sort of went on anyway under the table, but the fact is it essentially stopped because we were trying to link it to some political issues in our, in our overall relationship with, with the Russians. And then finally, a major problem in my view lies in the funding for international cooperation. There are no dedicated funds for this area in most agencies of the U.S. federal government. Furthermore, legislation governing agency S&T funding generally requires them either to justify their international work in terms of their benefits to U.S. science or to their domestic missions. Ironically, the most liberal rules are in the department that in general is most opposed to these interactions, namely DOD. Anything can be done in spending money abroad in the name of, of national security. Well, does one need new legislation appropriating money for S&T cooperation? For example, giving money to the State Department. Actually, it is one possibility, and it already did happen when the Soviet Empire imploded and funds were made available by the Congress through the SEED Act, and also the Freedom Support Act. And some of that money was used for science cooperation in Eastern Europe and also in the former uh, Soviet, Soviet Union countries, the CIS countries. But I think the same goal could be reached simply by changes in the nature of the spending authority for each of the technological agencies. It would take a sort of brave, resounding policy authorization statement on the part of, of uh, of, of someone, well, on the part of the Congress, a statement that S&T cooperation is really an active element of U.S. foreign policy and that each agency is charged with defining that policy in terms of its mission and with the political guidance of state to ensure overall, uh, political uh, overall compatibility with U.S. foreign policy goals. And interestingly, I recently learned there was an effort back in the Carter administration to create a new government agency for the direct support of international cooperation in science. And that proposal actually made it through three of the four congressional hurdles, two authorization bills and one appropriations bill in the House. But it was killed in the Senate 
by one member who felt it would tread on the toes of AID. And all I can say is, what a shame. They, they started and they got the appropriation of $10 million, but it never made it, and so it never happened. Now, I'm frankly not sure that another agency is the best answer to the problem. But our S&T cooperation needs to be broad, encompass the full range of mission-oriented research of our federal technical agencies, but it would require an indication from the Congress that international S&T cooperation is, in fact, encouraged and fundable. And Jack Marburger, I was very pleased to see that your number, the last criterion in your sixth criteria about funding projects this year in your OMB, OSTP memorandum to the agencies, you had a statement in there that we will look favorably on, on projects uh, which strengthen international partnerships that foster advancement of scientific frontiers. Anyway, administration of such monies is not simple, but I honestly believe it's a problem. And as I said, I think Vice Minister Deng Nam of China is going to suggest next week that we do try to create some sort of binational fund for U.S.-China cooperation. <coughs> I thought I had a final, final page here. Just in conclusion, we in fact um, did sell our house in Dallas. Uh, <laughs> we bought one in Washington. I survived the transition to the new administration. And I've worked with great enthusiasm for Secretary Colin Powell since January 2001. He's been a great supporter of what we're trying to do. He spoke eloquently about science at state at an annual meeting of the National Academy and recently reaffirmed his commitment to S&T by approving George Atkinson as my successor as his S&T advisor. Still, for all of that, and while I think we have in fact made some progress in the past three years, I want you to know that S&T is still shallowly rooted, shallow rooted in state as an institution, and there's a lot more to do. And for all of you who share my view that S&T is an essential element of foreign policy, eternal vigilance should remain your watchword. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>